Hey, hey, brothers and sisters, time for another Wednesdays for Revival. Uh, this one's titled, uh, Free of Guilt and Shame to Live in the Light. Now, this one came from a recent con conversation from someone that reminded me of the problem of ongoing guilt in people's lives and how we frankly just try to hide from it until we understand what Jesus does with it. So this will help us in our witnessing. As we get this, I'm going to give you an example of what I do in my witnessing and addressing this kind of need. Um, hiding from guilt. In witnessing, I run into deep-seated guilt combined with the conviction, God will never forgive me. A person rarely says, oh, I'm too wicked, God will never forgive me. Instead, folks are deeply shamed by their guilt before God. Like Adam and Eve before one another, they try to cover their shame with their own efforts to hide from it. Nothing in all of creation is hidden from God. Everything is naked and exposed before his eyes, and he is the one to whom we are accountable. Hebrews 4, 13. So in our witnessing, we need to keep in mind that all those we're trying to reach are loaded down with a weight of guilt that left to themselves, they can only try to hide from. We need to address this need with Jesus. Highest order wickedness. A recent conversation I had focused on this need. The person asked whether God would forgive the worst person imaginable right before capital punishment was administered. This is a common hypothetical question folks ask. Something that looks like it is either morbid curiosity or more often a deflection from having to talk about the gospel. And this demonstrates that it is actually about their deep-seated guilt. If God would forgive such a person, then, thinking goes, God would certainly be willing to forgive someone like themselves, hiding in shame from their guilt. Answering this question, I give two examples, a real-world one and a biblical one. The real-world example I use is a well-known executed criminal of unarguable witness, wickedness, excuse me, Ted Bundy. Even the most anti-capital punishment activist will at least agree that his crimes were of the highest order of unmitigated evil and unredeemable wickedness. I first bring up Bundy as an example of someone who, if God would forgive someone right before their capital punishment, never even in the tiniest degree did that person do anything to deserve God's mercy, including last-minute repentance. Two Professions of Faith I leave the description of Ted Bundy hanging right there, his evil wickedness nakedly exposed with no possibility of hiding from it, and then I turn to the biblical example, the thieves on the cross. Two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with Jesus. When they came to the place called the skull, they nailed him to the cross. And the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left, Luke 23, 32-33. Some translations use the word robber to describe these men suggesting that they weren't deserving of a death penalty. Yet the word used to describe them is better translated as murdering mugger. Someone who makes his living lying in wait for innocent people, attacking them, murdering them, and then robbing their courses. Not a one-time only criminal, such a person lived by a depraved indifference that marked him as one whose crimes were of the highest order of unmitigated evil and unredeemable wickedness. Both of these men cried out to Jesus with a profession of faith. One in his pain and despair cursed and mocked Jesus, demanding that he prove himself to be the Messiah and save both of them from the agony of the cross. The other rebuked the first criminal for his lack of fear of God and expressed a sentiment of repentance. But the other criminal protested, don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man, he hasn't done anything wrong. Luke 23, 40 and 41. This other criminal then expressed faith in Jesus. He said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Luke 23, 42. There it is. An actual in the electric chair conversion. A true on the lethal injection table profession of faith. Hanging on that cross, the switch had already been thrown. The poison was already pumping into his veins. All this criminal had before him was the completion of his death and his standing in judgment before his maker. Did God accept this death row conversion? Had the spirit moved this man, giving him the new birth by which he then professed repentance and faith that flows from a saving union with Christ hanging on the cross next to him? Or were this man's words, like the other criminals, just the words of worldly regret, born of a heart that knows it is too late, but is going out with one last mocking cry of rebellion? Jesus' response makes it clear that this man's less than a minute left in life cry was born of the Spirit. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me 
in paradise. Luke 23, 43. There you have it. A man with the most despicable life imaginable at the last possible moment of life made a profession of faith to which God said yes. He did nothing to earn this, nor could he do anything to prove his worth afterwards. Instead, an exception to the rule, this man was ushered from conversion to immediate death to judgment. There he found that his name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. All his sins were forgiven in the death of Jesus, who hung on the cross next to him. Would God forgive the worst of the worst at the last possible moment? The answer is, he already has, and he will again. Back to Bundy. After showing this amazing gift from the biblical example, I return to Bundy. We can't know for sure if anyone is saved, apart from the Bible's testimony. Yet Jesus did say that we would, approximately, know his saved by the fruits in their lives. If a person makes a saving profession of faith and lives for some period of time afterwards, they will necessarily, inevitably, grow in the fruits of the Christian life. Faith and repentance that yields growing godliness, love for God, and holiness, living in obedience to him. While we can't know yet whether Bundy was savingly regenerated by the Spirit, his life after his profession of faith certainly suggests he was. Aside from expressions of repentance, he also brought forth appropriate fruits. So, for example, cooperating with police in locating his victims that their families might bury their bodies. He did other things, but we won't go into them now. While not proof guaranteed that he was saved, Bundy's final days do indeed demonstrate that God is both just, Ted willingly went to the electric chair, and merciful, Ted sought to make amends where he could. Some people want to quibble at this point with the Ted Bundy example, so I drive them back to the biblical example, which cannot be argued against. I then apply the lesson to them and me. If God will forgive such a despicable person as these in these examples, surely he is willing to forgive despicable characters like you and me. Guilt can be removed. Shame does not have to drive us into perpetual hiding. We can be free and live in the light who is Jesus. Brothers and sisters, let's pray. Dear Lord, no matter the lies we tell ourselves to momentarily feel better, we all know we are guilty and so we want to hide from you in our shame. Forgive us for not believing that you are faithful and just to forgive all in Christ. Give us the joy of living in the truth that all condemnation is gone for those who are yours in Jesus. Then send us to tell others this glorious news. O oh Lord, give us lots of converts, freed from guilt and shame and living in your light. Restore to us the years the locusts have eaten, Jesus. Pour out your spirit of revival on us. We ask for your glory together with your Father and your Spirit's glory. Amen. So that's it, brothers and sisters, for another one. Um, may you have joy of witnessing the, the rest of this week and next week and until we talk again. And may his grace and mercy that is in Jesus continue to grow you in the, the spirit-powered life that you might enjoy the glory of God. And until I see you again, I love you. God bless. Bye-bye. <laughs>